In God's Word, our text for today is going to be in John chapter 3, six, uh, chapter 3, and we're going to be in uh, verses 16 through 18, I know it says through 21 in the bulletin, uh, but just made a quick change, uh, not right now, but made a change throughout the weekend and to go to verses 16 through 18, if you're in the Red Bible, it's going to be on page 752. In this, uh, John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Maybe see. When the year um, 2009, there is a uh, famous college football player by the name of Tim Tebow. Now, if, if you uh, know anything about college football, he's arguably one of the best to ever do it. He was a quarterback for the uh, University of Florida from 2006 to 2009, won a Heisman Trophy. And he's also a very outspoken Christian. He was born to uh, missionary parents. I believe he was also born in the Philippines and has always been very outspoken with his faith. You know, uh, these athletes get such a big platform, they always have a microphone in their face, and he uh, never shied away from sharing the gospel and indeed proclaiming that he is a follower. Of Christ. Now, um, in the year 2009, it was the eve of the national championship game against the University of Oklahoma. And typically, what football players did, if you played, you get to sometimes, if you want, you can put what's called eye blacks, a little kind of like a black sticker underneath your eyes, and you get to write a little message, right? Maybe it's the, the mantra of your team or whatever, right? And uh, in the weeks leading up to this, he was putting Philippians or Phil 4.13 week after week after week. And the uh, team was doing well. They were a dominant team at, at that time. And, uh, but on the eve of the biggest game of the year, he decided he wanted to change things up a bit. He wanted to put a different message. He wanted to put John 3.16. And so he goes to his coach the night before uh, and uh, especially at this level of the game, that they can be very superstitious. What, you want to make a change like this before the biggest game? Uh, thankfully, though, Tebow was able to convince his coach to let him make this change, and so he had on here John 3.16. Uh, they went out the next day. They would win that game and become national champions. A few days later, a few days later, uh, getting lunch, Tebow and his parents and his head coach uh, got a phone call from the PR guy from Florida saying that John 3.16, during the duration of the game and the moments after, was Googled tens of millions of times. Uh, in total, I looked it up, that game was viewed by about 30 million people. And John 3.16 was presented there on the big screen. And what a great uh, moment and opportunity to share this important verse. And, you know, when I was growing up, uh, Remember John 3.16 is one of the first verses you maybe memorize in church. There's usually a little song to it, a melody to it as well. It's just one of the things that you do growing up within the church, right? Uh, maybe you've seen it on a bumper sticker or a t-shirt, you know, for you Gen Zers and Millennials. Maybe you saw it in somebody's bio on their Instagram or their X account, right? And so it's definitely out there. And I think many times it, it can be maybe misunderstood or at least not seen in the fullest context. And, and that is uh, my task for this morning, is to walk us through this verse, uh, not just 16, but 16 through 18, and to really dive deep into this passage. And the first thing we want to start with, starting with verse 16, is that what we see here is that God is the first mover. He is the first cause of everything, right? Right from the beginning, right? Uh, God is the primary mover. Our story, the whole big story, starts with him. And we see here that his action is rooted in his love. It was he that loved the world, 
and not the other way around. And we'll flesh this out more as we go. Now, in more uh, deistic views uh, of God, he is the creator of the world, sure, right? But then quickly exits off stage from his creation, never to have any relation with it. There's no category of personal feeling or compassion to his creation. Some say God is the great clock maker and puts all the gears and levers and stuff together and then lets it go and just lets it whine and he just leaves the room, right? So this type of hands-off or good luck with that type of God is not what we have with the God of the Bible. We see that from the beginning. It is his initiation and his continued hand in redemption that is in play. And we see this all throughout Scripture. Now what this should do for us then, seeing that he is the first cause, the first mover, and this should take all of the eyes and our own eyes off of ourselves and what we think we may have accomplished from our own works. This is so often the temptation for us as believers to think that sometimes we even merit uh, any ounce of the salvation that we have, any ounce of God's grace, right? Pride quickly builds up within us, right? Calvin says uh, on this that scripture everywhere extols his, meaning God's pure and simple mercy, which abolishes all merits. So scripture does not state that God was moved to save us by seeing in us something deserving of such a blessing, of such grace, and of such mercy, but he ascribes the glory for our salvation entirely to his love. That is where it starts. Now to look at this, right, as, as far as God uh, loving the world, we want to uh, uh, go into this a bit. I want to make sure we don't mix up uh, what we mean by God loves the world, because I think we are told clearly um, in Scripture not to love the world, in fact, right? Uh, are we not supposed to be friends or be friendly or loving with the world? Now for us, our love of the world is is biblically portrayed in the negative, right? We are told not to love this world in a manner in which we participate in the wickedness and the darkness and the sin of it. We don't identify with who we are and how we live our lives with the world. A couple of verses here that touch on this, James 4, 4. In fact, to be a friend with the world is enmity with God. First John 2, 15 through 17, it says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so we see God's love for the world then is a love for his creation. God exercises love to the world so that it will not all be lost. A love that will restore what has been broken. Now the context, the context here is that the world is in darkness. As we see later on in John chapter 3, the people love that darkness rather than the light. And so everything is not okay. Typically people might view John 3.16 in a vacuum, maybe as a, a cherry-picked, feel-good kind of verse, right? See, God loves us, and then that's it, right? That's all they want to know, right? They see that, for, or they read, for God so love, and then just forget everything else that comes after us. But we need to look at the fuller picture here. God is not acting upon a good world. He's not acting upon people who are righteous and holy. In reality, it's quite the opposite. For God is acting and he is moving towards a world that is broken, that is corrupt, and that is sinful to the brim along with those who are in it. For a God so loved the world is also not saying that everyone is just saved, kind of like a blanket statement, a, a free-for-all kind of soteriological uh, uh, you know, a game where everybody just wins, right? You know, look under your seats, there's salvation right now. It's not what we're told here in the Bible. We'll get into this more in just a moment. But what we see is that however God chooses to act towards his creation, that's where it stands. Or it is in sin, it is in darkness. And indeed, that is where we all once stood. 
Now, moving along through the second half of verse uh, 16 and 17, what does the love of the Father give us? Well, we see clearly here that his love gives us his Son. The very result of God's love for the world is found in the Son of God. The love of God, as one uh, scholar said, the love of God is not floating in abstraction, but embodies in human flesh. God's love is made manifest in what and who he gave to the world. This should compel us to think about the great value and the cost of our salvation. The price of it would not just be for anyone to die or some animal or some random sacrifice. No, not some pick a name out of a bucket to bring about salvation. No, it took the life of the Father's only begotten Son to bring about our salvation and how great that cost is. And so you see, our only hope for us and for this world is rooted in Christ. He is the hero of the story. And the text says, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. It doesn't matter if you are rich or or poor or whatever nationality or background you come from, whatever color your skin is or whatever all these social barriers that 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 uh, that culture constructs. Right? Uh, God's grace breaks down all of those things. It doesn't matter if you have the shorter catechism memorized backwards. Right? It's all Christ, and only those who believe in Him and put their faith in Christ will be saved. And we'll get into more, uh, uh, we're going to touch a lot on, on, okay, what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to have a faith, or a, a saving faith? Before that, before we, uh, before we get to that, in verse 18, it talks about condemnation. For there is condemnation for those who do not believe. And once again, um, Jesus is not giving his life for a neutral crowd. He weren't sitting on the fence until Jesus came around and saved us. No, indeed, we were dead in our sin, right? Not sick, but dead. Paul talks about this in Ephesians 2, 1 through 6. And just this passage alone, twice he emphasizes the reality of us being dead in sin. He says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is not at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So dead in sin is the default. It is the starting point. Whether we like it or not, whether we think that is fair or not, the words of Christ are true um, here in John chapter 3 and all throughout Scripture as we just looked, right? This is utterly and inescapably clear to us about where we once stood. Paul again brings this out. Uh, and, and there's some, many, many places we can go to. I want to go to Romans uh, 5, uh, 6 through 8. Paul says that while, uh, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died us. And where it says, while we were still weak, we can translate the Greek in there as to a helpless position. David, in his psalm, in Psalm 51, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So even at the very moment that we become alive, sin is a very big problem for us all. Now if God were to send his son just to rescue a bunch of uh, good and righteous people. We, we wouldn't really see that as a very big deal because, you know, we probably do the same. And here's a little application here. We tend to do good to those who do good to us, right? How often do we do good and show love and mercy and forgiveness to those who hate us? 
do we apply the same love that has been extended to us back to those around us? Especially to those who, well, maybe aren't exactly on our Christmas card list. Do we apply and extend that same love, that we have been, what we have been given? Now, turning our attention to faith and believing, looking at what is at stake here, to have faith and to place our trust in Christ, as we're told in verse 18, is the most important thing for us, whether it's yesterday, today, and forever. It's what being a Christian is. It is indeed our only hope from the alternative, which, is, again, as we see, is the condemnation. Now, we need to know what real, authentic, saving faith in Christ is. Uh, Dr. Kevin DeYoung, in a, in a sermon on, on this passage, he says that, okay, saving faith is not just mere knowledge, but it's also not less than that. There are things we know or to know and believe about Christ. Now, a lot of people will say, and we've probably heard this said, well, it's more of a relationship over Religion, right? Give me Jesus. I don't care about theology or doctrine or things that, like that. All you Presbyterians are all weird with your confessions and stuff. Um, no creed but Christ, right? It, it's things that people like to say. But indeed, I heard a pastor say this once that those types of attitudes in and of themselves also presuppose a certain type of theology. They assume that they know what God wants from his people and what the people should or shouldn't know about God, thus making a theological statement, all right? Now, another response should be to this and these types of things, uh, uh, these types of attitudes, is really, I think, practically, how can we have any genuine relationship with anyone, let alone Christ, if we know nothing about them? Think about maybe some of the people that you are closest to, the closest relationships you've ever had and have. It's impossible to be that close to someone yet not really know who they are, right? You can look at, a, okay, a, a doctor with his patient, right? In order to treat them, in order to help them, uh, they have to diagnose and they need to know what's going on. That's why when we go to doctor's appointments, they ask, okay, uh, do you drink? Do you smoke? Do you ha have you been exercising? How many times have you been through the Burger King drive through this past week, right? <laughs> All these other things, I say that because that's kind of my, you know, my little thing that I like to do, right? And so we have to be honest in, in these conversations, right? They have to know what is going on, okay? Um, what are some of these things that we should know about Christ then? Well, number one, we know that he's divine. He's not just some guy or some good teacher that lived long ago. One scholar said it like this. He says, the deeds and the words of Jesus are the deeds and words of God. If this be not true, then the whole book is blasphemous. We know that in the beginning, he was with God and he was God. Uh, Edmund Clowney on this, he said, the word was with God, God's eternal fellow. The word was God, God's own self. He's God. And then all things were, were made through him. He's sent by the Father, and just kind of walking through places in John, uh, John's Gospel, um, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. We see that there is a complete unity uh, between him and the Father. I and the Father are one, and, and he says in chapter 10. We know in, in chapter 11, Jesus, uh, said, we know that he is the, in his death and resurrection, we have life believe that Jesus is who he claims to be. Now, all, those are all very good things to know in this life as a believer. Now, on the other side of the coin, faith is not just a mental checklist of things. We know we might have listened to all of that and say, yep, I got that, I'm good, so that's it, right? No. I want to turn to the, our, our confession in chapter 14. The title of it is Of Saving Faith, right? And there's some very helpful chapters in here. I kind of summarize them uh, a little bit. Um, but the second portion in, in this the chapter tells us that the Christian believes that God's word is true. And they act and respond differently towards different
different passages of scripture. What do we mean? Well, we yield, excuse me, we yield obedience to the commands. We tremble at the threatenings or the warnings. And we embrace the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. In the next section, it says, it takes it deeper. It says, but the principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon, upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. And so what we see that he alone is the object that our faith must rest on. Nothing else will do. Nothing else can do. And I love how in the next chapter, I'll read this real quick. It shows how this is applied in us because we're all a bit different. We have different stories and things that we go through and struggle with, sure. And it says here that in 14.3, it says, This faith is different in degrees, weak or strong, may often and in many ways assailed or attacked and weakened, but gets the victory. Growing up in many to the attainment of a full assurance through Christ who is both the author and finisher of our faith. And so you see, for, for all of us, there have been many moments of weakness where sin creeps in, and for maybe stretches of time, we look like the old man. We look like the old self. There are times where we, we may even ask, am I still a Christian, you know? Or how long must this fight go on? But Christians know that the presence of this struggle with sin, this fight against it, is itself indeed, I think, evidence of genuine Christianity. Uh, uh, John Gerstner, who was the, the mentor of R.C. Sproul, who we all know and love, he said, the fight against sin is the sign of new life. The very fact that he hates his sin and is appalled and disgusted by it shows that he's alive in Christ. Now with that said, I think there should be much concern and worry for the person who calls himself a Christian, yet there is no struggle, yet there is no conflict, there is no repentance. I've enjoyed reading uh, some uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones re recently, and on this, um, um, he says that people who have no sense of conflict at all in their lives are patently just not Christians. They are in the sleep of death spiritually. So the Christian life is a life, it's a fight. It is a war. There is conflict. There is tension, right? That is how it is. For the true Christian, our fight against the darkness of this world and the sin that still dwells in us is a fight that we know we have assurance and that ends in victory. I wanted to close um, with this last verses comes from 1 John chapter 5 verses uh, 4 through 5 and it says as it says for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God you see if Christ is the object of of our faith, and we have a faith that truly saves, a faith that can sustain us through this life, no matter the trials or the lowest moments that we may go through. Paul tells us that this faith itself is a gift from God. Maybe right now some of you are at a, a low point in your faith. Maybe we have made our faith uh, about something that is just, it's just head knowledge. It's just, I need to know the facts and that's it, right? We check off all the essentials. We read all the cool books and stuff, but that's it. We just go about our day because, well, we're really busy. We might be anxious because this life really does go by way too fast, and we have so much more that we need to do. Now, if someone on the side comes to us and says, well, do you believe in Jesus? Well, of course I do, right? We can go and recite all the cool theology and stuff we know, right? We got that part down. But then actually living out our faith is something we'll do only if we can fit it into our schedule, if we have time for it. Brother and sisters, may we repent of such shallow faith and be reminded over and over to the day that we are with him that our faith in Christ is so much more than just head knowledge. May we learn more and more how to accept, how to receive, 
and embrace and rest in Christ. And we started off, I started off the sermon talking about God as the first mover. And I'm with this, a great uh, Puritan once wrote, I, I don't know who it was or I don't put the name, but he said this. He said, speaking of God, thou dost not move men like stones, but, uh, but dost endue them or give them or move them with life, not to enable them to move without thee, but in submission to thee, the first mover. Let thy love draw me nearer to thyself. Wean me from sin, mortify me to this world, and make me ready for my departure hence. Secure me by thy grace as I sail across the stormy sea. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you have shown us, the grace and the mercy all your attributes, Lord, that, that you have shared and revealed to us, Lord. Forgive us for the times we take for granted those things and just go about in this life, Lord. Help us to look to you and remember the object of our faith is in your Son. The expression of your love is found in Christ, Lord. And help us to truly walk in acceptance and obedience, Lord, and to embrace him, to embrace your word and the promises that you have given to your people, Lord, and, may it, and it will sustain us, Lord. I was to remember that it will sustain us, Lord, through this life, no matter what we may go through, Lord. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and take our inserts. Um, we're going to sing Nearer, Still Nearer. And I'll draw your attention to the third verse here. It says, Nearer, Still Nearer, Lord, to be thine. Sin with its follies, I glad re resign. All of its pleasures pop in its pride. Give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. Um, you know, just this yesterday, you know, the, there was an assassination attempt on um, President Trump. And... Uh, it was just a lot of fear, anxiety, and just uncertainty. But we need to remember, as Christians, that our leader is Christ. And he wasn't assassinated. He came to die on a cross for us. And he rose victorious for us and gives us new life. And that is our true leader, the one who has uh, conquered death and conquered sin for us. Let's sing the song as a prayer, um, and let's believe together that Christ will draw us near to us, or draw us near to him. And uh, take comfort in that. Are you ready? You're good. my 
sinful, no contrite heart, grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Nearer, still nearer, Lord, to be thine. Sin with its follies I gladly resign. All of its pleasures, pomp and its pride, Jesus, my Lord, crucified. Give me by Jesus, my Lord, crucified. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last. Till safe in glory my anchor is cast. Through endless ages ever to be nearer my Savior, still nearer to thee. still nearer to thee. Amen. Amen. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Now and forever. Amen. Please greet one another in Jesus' name and... Um, Give Michael a big pat on the back. <laughs>